I've had a question from Alex in South Carolina who tells me that he has been suffering from panic attacks increasingly over the last couple of months. He tells me that he is a competitive guy in a highly competitive field and competition is, is increasing exponentially. And he just irrationally suddenly loses the anchor to his strength and uh, courage and clarity, starts uh, having palpitations, tachycardia, and um, uh, he, he shakes. He starts, the whole body starts, starts shaking. He tells me he's a big, strong guy. He's an alpha male. And it is not only disconcerting, he finds it actually embarrassing. Well, Alex, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. I mean, we all of us are children. We're, we're little babies, really, uh, inside these bodies. The baby we once were never went anywhere, in other words. We just kind of grew rings around it. And so there will always be this existential dread, this terror, the fear of dissolution of the self. And it's true, competitiveness is increasing exponentially. I mean, it would do. The resources upon which we depend are, relatively speaking, dwindling rapidly. And even though we don't consciously think of this as animals, we do know subconsciously that this is going on and this naturally increases competitiveness. Now, normally this competitiveness would be expressed in going out for the hunt or picking the most berries or whatever it is to do with survival. Because we don't have these direct needs anymore, we express it in whatever field we are operating. So everybody's becoming more competitive, no matter what it is they're doing. I say everybody, that's the impression we get. And what this does is it strains the kidneys in the back, energetically speaking, causes us to very subtly arch the back. And, and that squeezes the adrenal glands, which pumps, uh, this in turn pumps cortisol, the stress hormone, into the system which is addictive, like crack, and we keep pumping it every 10 seconds or so to keep it moving round, because although it's not pleasant, it is intense, and we love intensity. Now, an overload of this, combined with the mind racing and drawing the heat of the body up into the forebrain, um, has the effect of sending too much heat through the heart area, and that is then what causes the racing heart, the, the regular heartbeat, and the shaking, which comes also from the, or mostly in fact, from the kidneys directly being in a state of contraction and giving the sensation of being really cold, even if you're not. Well, the first thing is to get your breathing to settle, because you'll notice that you'll be breathing irregularly. If you grab your ribs like that, and you just pull them apart, you keep your elbows and your shoulders relaxed. You keep breathing while you're doing it. It doesn't hurt. It feels good. You might find at first it feels a bit stitchy, but that's just contraction, which you work through. As you see, I mean, it's not hurting me at all, unless you're completely insane. It won't, you won't pull your ribs apart. You keep pulling, and then you let go. You wait for a second, and you'll notice a beautiful feeling of warmth, as if you just drunk a, a shot of uh, whiskey filling the solar plexus, which makes you feel for a moment, if you tune into it, all right, everything's all right. Then you place your hands on your lower back area, the mid-lower back area. It's just like this. You just put your palms behind, and you let the warmth of your palms penetrate into the kidneys. You breathe deeply, and you let your breath fill up in your hands, as it were. And as you do that, you just let the kidneys soften and relax. You just let this whole area of your body soften. And although it may seem rather indirect and not as effective as, say, taking a sedative or whatever, you will find in the same time that it takes for a sedative to come on, which is roughly, it would start working a little bit right about now, the heat is getting you to relax. And this relaxation is actually stopping the panicking. The shaking will already be calming down by now. Of course, if you have somebody doing it for you, so much the better. But often you don't. So when you're sitting on your own, you do it like this. You just sit like this, you let the heat penetrate, and roughly about now, your mind will be clearing. You then take a finger and place it right here in the center of the forehead. And you just hold it there lightly, and you wait. And it's as if you're penetrating the bone with your fingertip. You, 
you feel it soften um, the, the forehead and the whole of the skull starts to relax. Then you move your finger away very, very slowly and you'll notice by now the mind has become a more unified field. You're then able, if you sort of lean back inside as it were, to ask yourself, what's my intention here? You know, specifically in the, in the next half an hour or whatever. Whatever it is you've got to get, uh, get done. My intention is to get such and such done and find myself in a cheerful mood, ready to cope with whatever. From this day on, you can then remind yourself of the perspective of things. We you know we are all transient. None of us are going to be here very long. They're like that, really, relatively speaking. There's no point wasting a second of it, not enjoying it, even the scary bits. To love every moment of being here. And to know that this transient phenomenon is no more than like a flower, a beautiful flower in the garden. We come, we serve by sharing our beauty, and then we go. And that's all there is to it. There's nothing to panic about. Flowers, we presume, they don't panic. They just are beautiful. And that's all we have to be too. Just be beautiful and everything will come to you. And that really, in a nutshell, is the way to deal with panic attacks.